Good evening, Sportsonians. How's everybody doing out there tonight? I hope everybody is having a good holiday. I am Mike Aglia Laurel, and like I said last week, we were going to get a sports zone to you this week. Unfortunately, Dave Hastings and Eric Tressler will not be able to make it for the recording that we're doing here, so I'm on my own for this, but it was important to me to get at least one more sports zone out before the new year. So this probably will not be a long one, but I do have some things I would like to talk about now. We're going to talk a little Mets, obviously, because it's me. And we'll talk a little football going into week 17, kind of preview the playoff picture a little bit. To start with the Mets, so obviously we've talked a lot about them over the last month with everything going on with free agency and everything. And the conversation me and Eric had last week was what the Mets would need to do to make this a solid winning offseason, to at least make you think that they were, in fact, the favorites to win the division, not just (coughs) propaganda that Brody Van Wagenen came out and said last week that he said, internally, we feel we are the favorites. Not, Not just to have that to be talk, but to have that actually be a reality. And, you know... We were talking about some of the moves that the Mets could do. And, of course, I've been saying the whole time they need at least one more reliever. They've they've brought in Jay Rus Familia. They've got Edwin Diaz. I wanted them to get Andrew Miller over the weekend. Andrew Miller sound, uh, signs a two-year, $25 million contract with the St. Louis Cardinals that has a vesting option for the third year. We found out later the Mets and Yankees, both teams, never even made a a legitimate offer to Andrew Miller because of the injuries and everything, which was uh, more than a little surprising. Uh, I think you could definitely find it realistic that maybe the Mets wouldn't make the offer because that's the type of team they are. But even the Yankees to not make an offer, that is somewhat surprising. Um, so that's off the board. Uh, we talked about A.J. Pollock, the Mets signing him for center field uh, last week. And we talked about the different contracts that we would hope it would, that I would hope that it might take to get him on board. You find out over the weekend that he's still holding out for a six or seven year deal, which realistically no team is going to give him a six or seven year deal. Mets are hoping it comes back down to four years. So In the last couple weeks, they have made a couple depth moves. They have signed Raji Davis to a minor league deal, and last week they signed Gregor Blanco to a minor league deal. Now, on the surface, teams sign players to minor league contracts all the time. Teams sign older, maybe past their prime players to minor league contracts all the time in hopes of just bringing some depth on board in case anything happens because you need good fourth or fifth outfielders who can kind of step in in a pinch and if that's all these signings are I'm perfectly fine with it the problem is Mets have done things like this in the past where they bring players like this in under the guise of depth contracts and then they act like they don't have to do anything else And then they act like they can take the guys who are supposed to be brought in for depth and pass them off as starters, and we can all pretend that they did something. And that's that's a big problem if this happens here, because Raji Davis and Greg Arblanco are no longer starting caliber players. They are fourth or fifth outfielders at this point. They might be able to step in in a pinch for a week or two here or there, They are not your starting center fielders, nor should they ever be considered as such. And the the Mets have a decent track record for doing stuff like this. Like, the most famous one that I can remember is when they signed Fernando Tatis as a minor league free agent back in 2007. And then the next year, they tried passing him off as a starter because he had a pretty decent year when he had to fill in for some injuries, and it, it never worked out because Tatis was not a starter at that point in his career, and it's okay to catch lightning in a bottle when you're only relying on the guy as a depth piece, a bench piece, someone who only has to start every so often. It's a different thing to hope that that guy can continue the lightning in a bottle when you're putting more pressure on him to do it on an everyday basis. 
And that's my biggest problem, and that's my biggest concern with this Mets offseason, is that now you brought in Robinson Cano, Edwin Diaz, J. Ruiz Familia, Wilson Ramos, and I said last week that I thought the Familia signing would be better if they still added another arm to pair with him rather than just acting that bringing Familia back to the bullpen with him being in the eighth inning role and Edwin Diaz being your closer. To me, if that's all you did, you didn't really do anything. I felt it would be better served if you bring in another arm. So Familia is not the only one who you could act like that's your big bullpen get. And it's, it's, the same principle with the depth thing. Gregor Blanco, Raji Davis, if they're competing for your fourth or fifth outfielder jobs, job well done. You got three quality starters. You got a couple other guys who can really carry the load for you, and these guys are only there for defensive purposes and to fill in every once in a while. If there were anything more than that, guess what? You didn't do anything. (laughs) And to me, that will be the difference. Between a quality Mets offseason and the typical smoke and mirrors we normally get. So I will once again say what I think the Mets need to do for this to be a successful offseason. You have to sign Marwin Gonzalez, who can be your little Swiss Army Knife type player. Sign him for two or three years. Probably going to cost you at least $27 million. Could cost you as much as $33, $35 million over three years. You got to do that. You need to have the depth there. You need to have the depth there. There's a guy who could play seven different positions if you need him to. He's not going to play all seven of them well, but he could still play him there if you need him to. He could play right field. He could play left field. Predominantly been a shortstop. You know, he could play the infield, play first base, he could play third base. You need a guy who can do that. And then if him and, uh, him and Jeff McNeil are your top two guys off the bench and you're mixing and matching them, depending on the matchup, with guys like Frazier and Peter Alonzo and Brendan Nemo, now you really got something there. And I know people are afraid of A.J. Pollock because of the injury thing. He's the best center fielder out there. Adam Jones is not a center fielder anymore, and he's really the only other legitimate center fielder out there. If you don't want A.J. Pollock, I want a guy like Abisail Garcia. Not a power hitter guy, but he's a guy I think could do well if you give him a one- or two-year deal. He did hit 330 and was an all-star back in 2017. Did not have the best season last year. Has been kind of up and down in his career. But he's a guy who, if you put him in right field, you could move Nemo to center field, and you'd be all right, in my opinion. And he is a right-handed bat, if I'm not mistaken, which you do still need at least one more of those. And then you have to get another bullpen arm. You have to get another bullpen arm. You already lost that on Andrew Miller. So if you're sticking with the left-handed side of the conversation, Justin Wilson would probably be your best available. If you bring in Oliver Perez, my God, you're really showing that the Mets as an organization are never going to learn. And uh, Listen, I know Perez has kind of reinvented himself as a lefty specialist. If you look at his numbers, though, his numbers are still horrible. Just absolutely horrible. Because they try to put him in positions where he's doing more than just facing batters from the left-hand side. And it's pretty obvious it still doesn't work. So I, I want no part of Oliver Perez. I would much rather give me... Justin Wilson, and we'll go through the list of left-handed relievers here, because to me, he's the best one. Zach Britton is still out, still out there. I don't look as Britton as a, as a guy who comes in and just pitches to lefties. Not that I'd be opposed to Zach Britton by any stretch of the imagination, though I am worried with all the injuries he's had, he's not as good as he was in 2016. So if you bring him in, you can't hope for 2016 Zach Britton. So that would be my one concern there. Uh, the other thing, and I forgot to say this, the other thing I don't want to see in the outfield is I don't want Melky Cabrera in the outfield. Because I have heard rumblings that the Mets would try to bring Melky Cabrera back in. Uh, I don't want him and Robinson Cano back on the same roster. I don't. They were a bad combination when they were with the Yankees. That's what, why the Yankees had no problem letting both of them walk. I don't want them on the same roster 
now that they're both five and six years older. I just don't. I think that would be a horrible combination, and if you do that, you're asking for problems. That'll end the Mets talk for tonight. Now we'll we'll do a little football talk real quick. So we had a big week 16 in the NFL. Cowboys clinched the division. Both the Giants and the Jets lost in very close games, games that they were both leading for the majority of only to watch the other team come back. We've seen the Colts really put their stamp down as a team that could be a serious threat at the very least to make the playoffs. Maybe could get one win, depending on who they play in the first round. And then you had some some other things going on with some of the other teams. We'll take a look at the picture. The Ravens, in my opinion, definitely look like the favorite to come out of the AFC Northern Division with their victory over the Chargers. Very surprising victory over the Chargers on uh, Saturday night. Uh, the Titans did pull out a win over the Redskins. So right now when you look at the wild card in the AFC, you have the Chargers who have clinched the fifth seed, and then you have a battle between the Colts and the Titans at 9-6, and six, and then you have the Steelers kind of on the peripheral there at 8-6-1. and one. And... You look basically your division your division champions. The Ravens would have to lose this week, and the Steelers would have to win uh, for for them to uh, to not win the division. And just take a look at some of the matchups for this week. And we're not going to do any picks this week. I'm not going to do any picks without uh, Dave or Eric here. So to kind of run down where the schedule is at the. Steelers take on the Bengals in Pittsburgh this week, and the Ravens take on the Cleveland Browns in Baltimore. And the Browns are at 7-7-1 and right now. They have won their last three straight games. Now, I do believe uh, the Ravens will probably wind up winning this week. But at the very least, you get, a, you get a battle between the rookie quarterbacks and Lamar Jackson and Baker Mayfield. So you have that going for you this week. And it's going to be very interesting to see what type of fight the Browns are able to put up. Because I do think this is going to be a very close game. But you got to go with the Ravens' defense right now, the way they're playing. Um, so you have that. If I have to pick between the Colts and the Titans, because those, in my opinion, those are my two favorites, uh, or at least the two guys who are the two teams who are the closest to making the playoffs. Just to kind of look, and they play against each other. It is the Colts taking on the Titans in Tennessee. That is your Sunday night game on NBC. So that has a lot on the line right there. And I'm going to be honest, I think the Colts take that game. I really do. I think the Colts, what they have going for them right now is two things they never really had in any time that Andrew Luck has been on the team, and that is they have an offensive line who can actually protect them, and they have a solid enough defense that can actually make some plays. Remember, this is a team that shut out the Cowboys a couple weeks ago. So you have that. And then you look at the NFC. Cowboys, Bears, Saints, and Rams have all locked up their divisions. Saints have the home field advantage throughout the playoffs as of right now. You'd have to be an idiot to say the Saints don't have the inside track of making the Super Bowl this year. The Seahawks have clinched the five seed. And then you look at the possible candidates for the six seed, and it's the Eagles and the Vikings. Vikings at 8-6-1, and one, the Eagles at 8-7. and seven. Vikings win, they would be in, as far as I know, based on uh, winning percentages and everything. And the Vikings take on the Bears this week. That game is in Chicago. And then Philadelphia will be playing the Redskins in Washington. So that should be interesting. And I do believe the winner of that game would... Would take on the Bears, uh, yeah, the Bears in the first round. And the Bears still have a shot at the bye week. I believe they have to win and the Rams have to lose this week for that to happen. But I think right now, you're looking at the Rams as your two seed. 
And the Rams will be probably playing this week without Todd Gurley. They bring in C.J. Anderson off the scrap heap, and he decides to play like uh, uh, he was five years ago. So you have to figure Gurley won't, won't play this week. And, you know, if if he could do it like that, again, the Rams won't lose too much. Rams taking on the Niners this week. And like I said, the Bears are taking on the Vikings this week. So it'll be tough matchups all around there. And the Cowboys do have to play the Giants this week. And you know the Giants aren't exactly going to lay down, even though at 5-10, and 10, you have to think that most Giants fans would be okay if they lose just to try kind of in, uh, increase their odds in the draft next year. So we'll see what that happens. But right now it's looking at least based off where the rankings are, that the Cowboys will have a home game in the first round of the playoffs, taking on the Seattle Seahawks. So that should be interesting. In my opinion, with the way Dallas has played over this entire season, I don't expect them to win this playoff game. I'm going to be honest. I know I usually pick against the Cowboys because it's kind of what I do. And the Seahawks haven't exactly been infallible either. But I just don't have the confidence in this team right now. Now, the defense has been playing well. I actually have more confidence in the defense than the offense, if I'm being totally honest here. But whatever's going on with that offense, and you could say it's Dak Prescott not really living up to the expectations that have been placed on him. You could say it's the play calling. Whatever it is, the offense just isn't right. You know, and they got Prescott, very nice weapon, and Amani Cooper, who's who has played very well since they've acquired him. And you do have uh, one of the best running backs in football, in Ezekiel Elliott. I don't think anybody can really deny that. But the problem is when Prescott's been called on for whatever reason, it's it's really a roll of the dice at this point. So. I would not have the confidence in the Cowboys against the Seahawks in the first round. So that's where we are with that. And as you could hear in my voice, I am kind of getting over a cold myself because it is the holidays after all. With that, I do think we will end this. Like I said, this was not going to be a very long episode tonight. I really just wanted to put something up as a thank you to everyone who has listened uh, this last year that we've we've done this new format with Sports Zone. Thank you to everybody who watches us on YouTube and listens on Tuesday nights when we do come to you. I will say one thing because I got to watch some of the basketball games yesterday. Um, I was very surprised the Lakers were able to beat the Warriors the way they did, especially when LeBron went down in the third quarter. But, um, you know, I am sure, I know this has been a problem for a few years now. But uh, why, why do NBA players complain after every call by the officials? Like, we know the officials don't get every call right. We We know this. But if this was any other sport, those players would be thrown out faster than 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 you could you could say than you could complain really the amount of times i saw calls on whether it was james harden or lebron james or anybody and they're complaining after every call and over exaggerating everything and talking up with the officials you know some if you did that in baseball they would have thrown you out after the fir- after at the end of the first time you did that they would have given you a warning and then would, they would have thrown you out after the second time and it's stuff like that that just kills me and it's why i think there's still a majority of people out there who don't take basketball as seriously as they used to and i know the jawing with the players really that kind of or excuse me the jawing with the officials you could trace that back to the 90s if you really wanted to because i remember hearing people say that they thought they were talking too much to the officials back then now, that's nothing compared to what it's gotten to be now and it's kind of pathetic when you think about it so that's one thing. That that's that's a general comment I have from watching the day's basketball games on Christmas Day, and I really hope that that winds up changing at some point. Because honestly, like especially Harden, I'll come down on him the hardest. I thought it was pathetic how much he just. He, it's like he's not even worried about playing his game. He's worried more about talking with the officials about the calls they make than playing the game. But dude, just shut up and play the game. 
That's what you get paid to do. You don't get paid to talk to the officials. Stop bothering the officials. You're lucky they don't throw you out for that. So that'll do it for me, and that'll do it for Sports Zone in 2018. So once again, I want to thank everybody for being a part of this. I want to thank Dave Hastings and Eric Tressler for being with us every week. Could not do this show without them. Hopefully, we will be back next week. We'll have a little something for you, hopefully either Tuesday or Wednesday. If not, we will definitely be back the week of the 8th. I think one way or another, I will try to come to you once again just to be able to keep doing this show weekly because honestly it's been a struggle for me to keep doing this show every week and just being able to put this out there is a small victory for me so i'm going to continue to do this as long as i can hopefully we get dave or eric with us next week and hopefully you all come with us to, for the ride in 2019 so i am mike aglialoro as always thank you all for listening we'll see you in one way shape or form next week. And Happy New Year and Happy Holidays to all.